without any uh, further delay, let's uh, welcome Sev Ashkenazi. Hi, Sev. Hello, Mark. Nice to see you, sir. What a life you've had and continue to have. Well, let's Perfect. hope this is not only the first meeting you and I have, but we'll have other things to talk about another time. I would love it. So, I would love it. But this time, I want to speak a little bit about your notions about, can you give folks a sense of your book, Swords of the Vatican? I mean, it was, well, it was a, it's a powerful piece. It is, I, I have decades of experience after the war, uh, 25, 18 and a half million Jews lived in the town where we lived which was about a third of the population before the war. The town's name was Tarnopol. It is today called Ternopil in Ukrainian. Out of the 18 and a half thousand Jews, 139 survived, and we were the only family unit. This is just to put it in perspective. So the book is, of course, about the Catholic Church, but it is not about me. There is very little of me in the book. Uh, I wanted to share with uh, you, with my children, with my family, with my friends, what I know. I did not want it to go, uh, <clears throat> to go uh, ignore unknown, and therefore the book. And it doesn't matter when, you, where you open the book, you have learning and you have news that you probably have never heard before. So I encourage you to, I encourage your listeners, potential readers to read the book. They will not be wasting their time. You I, say, you, you say, I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, one of the uh, quotes, um, too often indoctrination into hatred and ignorance is handed down from generation to generation. With the advent of television, 24-hour broadcast, the internet, and social media, the spread of hatred, lies, and misinformation is promoted at lightning speed. We live in a time where truth has never been more at risk. Jews, once again, are the target blamed for the ills of the world. If they are to fight millennia of malicious accusations, they must become the standard bearers of truth. So you talk about truth, and yet you also reflect on a time right now that seems to be distancing itself further from the truth. Everybody has their own truth. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> yes, indeed. It, <laughs> excuse me. It reminds me of the 30s, the atmosphere here. Kristallnacht didn't happen suddenly. It happened over a period of time. And the fact that we have students who are not informed, not, I wouldn't say poorly informed, but absolutely ignorant of facts who just espouse a, a cause that they have absolutely no idea about. And uh, I have a question for you. I'm sure you have Jewish friends. You have uh, maybe close friends. Who is a Jew? What makes a Jew a Jew? Could you tell me how you would describe uh, or Kim, if she's around, how you would describe a Jew? You're, you're, let me just, I think what you're getting at, I mean, I'd be happy to answer the question, but I think what you're getting at is that it's a, is it a culture? Is it a, I mean, essentially, it's so absurd to me because this division based on religion is just utter absurdity. But I, I would imagine that you, you, that all these religions create cultures. There's a Jewish culture, a Muslim culture, a Catholic culture, a Protestant culture, and that there is there are cultural norms that grow around them. It's more than just personal belief in a God. Am I wrong? Is that kind of what it is? No, you're perfectly right, but it depends what that culture teaches its children. And that's where it is, the, it, there is the basic difference between the Jews and the rest of the world. The, in 2000 years ago, a Roman philosopher, Flavius Josephus, known at the time and known to this day to be very, very prominent and quite accurate, who wrote an extensively about the Jews fighting the Romans, 
said that the preeminent concern of a Jewish family is the education of their children. That is 2,000 years ago. Not putting them, not raising them to put them behind the plow. Not raise them because when you're old, you want to be taken care of. But you raise them to become knowledgeable. Now, for Flavius Josephus to come to this conclusion, he had to look back for centuries, maybe a millennium, to come to a conclusion. That means that he had to reach to King David, wonderful, who wrote over a thousand poems, to King Solomon, who was the first king to be known as the wise, and there look at what the, the, what was the, the, the obsession of the families about their children. So it is like a polished stone. There is a difference between a stone that is not under erosion and one that is under erosion. The one under erosion is smooth, wonderful to hold, and may even have the tra traces of the history of the place. Well, it brings me great sadness to, to see the the rise of anti-Semitism and, and the Jew hating that is worldwide and any excuse to, I think, bring that out, uh, it, it seems, is, is taken. I want to ask you if you would mind, and I don't know to what extent you uh, speak about this or are comfortable speaking about this, but your, your life um, from that kind of oppression and hate and threat, I mean, the threat of death, I mean, they, they, as you kind of just noted, based on that you grew up in Ukraine and they, they came through and they, they rounded everybody up and killed them uh, and you were hidden with your family. I wonder if you can just speak to that period during which you emerged and then came to America with a sense that you would have religious freedom and also the freedom to live your life in every other way that you wanted. Well, when you have seen what we, what the survivors have seen, it is very difficult if you have really experienced it firsthand, not been told or taught or read about. It is very difficult to be very religious. My father was an Orthodox Jew, not overly religious, but religious. Shabbat was Shabbat, holidays were holidays. We were quite an obedient family to the Jewish laws. But when we entered the cellar, my father respectfully folded his talit, his tefillin, his yarmulke, the Bible, into a box and said, there is no God. And therefore we were still Jews and we still celebrated Shabbat. But when you go through what we went through, my entertainment in the ghetto was to hear a whistle from an older boy. We would run and we would watch someone die from hunger. This was our my entertainment in the ghetto. Jeez. Watch people die from hunger. Now, so let me, do, let me just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but let me just understand. Essentially, your father was saying, I'll respect the traditions of our faith, but I no longer have faith that well, there is ex any. Exactly. Yeah. You expressed it better than I could have. So this is where we emerge from. And we think uh, we owe our life to the Russians who liberated us and uh, who... Uh, were not exactly nice to us, but we survived. And from there, we were able to go to what would certainly be Poland after the war. And we spent a little time in Krakow. Then we emigrated to France and, uh, and the United States. Did you ever, what, do you remember the first sigh of relief you, not literal sigh of relief, but the sense you felt of the, the unburdening of fear and of, uh, the darkness. Do you remember when that was? What was it when you went to France? Was it when you went to Poland? Was it when you came to America? It or did was it never. never? It never? was never. When we emerged, we were there was still anti-Semitism all around us. 
Yes, we could see the sun, we could walk outside, but when we emerged out of practically every branch of every tree hung a man. Whether he was German or whether he was Russian or whether he was a spy or whether he was whatever, they were hanging each other. And the extraordinary vision I have is that none of these corpses had shoes on. Shoes were valuable, so the assassins took the shoes of their victims. An, an, an incredible story. And then what you did with your life here is pretty extraordinary. You know, the you got into the hotel business. Was that in your world prior to that? How did you get in the hotel business? I mean, you didn't just get into it. You really excelled at it. You Well, I entered the building business first. I was at UCLA. I was a PhD candidate in literature and had the opportunity to join someone who was building something. So I thought I would take a year or two off and then finish my thesis afterwards never happened. I started building and I built well over a hundred different buildings and projects throughout Southern California. And then one day we opened a building and apartment, all suites, very small apartments, because I thought that that was what needed. And and people wanted to rent the place for a month at a time. They were coming to work in the movie industry, in this, in that. We had more people who wanted to rent a month at a time than to give us a year lease. And that's how the hotel started. And, and that hotel. allowed me to start the all suite concept. So I'm credited with inventing the all suite concept. And that and is that the I built 11 hotels. That's the gold standard. Exactly. That Lermitage group is yes. yours. <laughs> Gosh, congratulations. I wish I had more time to talk to you. Let's visit again. I love that, you know, Thank you're you. so brilliant as a, a spokesperson for, um, this history that I think is so easily repeated and so easily forgotten. Albert, can you put up the book again? Because I want everybody to see it uh, again. Swords of the Vatican, Reflections and Polemics of a Witness to Evil. Wow. Uh, congratulations on a life well led and continues to make a difference. Severin Ashkenazi. Wow, Sev, really enjoyed our time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, Severin Ashkenazi, everybody. Bye-bye, Sev. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.